And uh, it's, uh, this is a, pro uh, a topic that I think has been making the rounds. And uh, once you hear about it, it starts to be more and more uh, compelling. It has a way of getting into your thinking, especially in otology. Um, I, we wanted to talk about this uh, migraine and Meniere's disease and the relationship, and I definitely uh, am going to do that. But I thought I would broaden the uh, talk to talk, if I'm gonna present a, a pathophysiologic model of migraine, I thought I'd run through the model and talk about where um, vestibular symptoms can be generated in that migraine uh, world that uh, our patients carry with them into our clinics. So, Get my controls. So we're going to, uh, I don't think I need to review vestibular physiology in any detail with this uh, crowd, but uh, we are going to review a, the currently accepted pathophysiologic model of migraine so that we can examine more closely how migraine mechanisms have, can create vestibular symptoms uh, in the cortex of the brain, in the brainstem nuclei, and other deep brain centers and even in the inner ear, which is a topic that has been of significant discussion, even in our neurotology uh, listserv recently. So um, none of us are gonna achieve a feat of balance like this, but uh, um, there is um, activity in the balance system that is no less impressive that goes on in the background at all times. If you would just, all we have to do is remember our bilateral bilateral vestibular loss patients who tell us that they cannot even read in bed because when their saccule is not uh, making compensatory eye movements for the bouncing in bed caused by the ejection of blood out of the aortic root, the, Im the image of the print on the page slips across the fovea and our visual image breaks down. So they have to actually uh, brace their head against the bars of the bed to read. Um, so um, it, this is just testimony to the fact that when something works this well, we are very, very sensitive to its dysfunction, even subtle levels of dysfunction. So as we know, uh, balance uh, is actually an integration of visual and somatosensory and uh, vestibular inputs. And uh, so everyone says, oh, this has three parts. It actually has four parts because um, there is an integration of those inputs that is essential for this to function uh, well. Uh, the, the inner, the vestibular labyrinth has five organs in each inner ear, two otolith organs, two which are linear accelerometers, of course, and three angular accelerometers. And it's important to note that the otolith organs came first and that the semicircular canals in evolution came later. Um, and they came later because they needed to solve a problem. And then hearing came after that. Hearing was just a, um, an extension of the transduction mechanism, a mechanical to electrical to high frequencies much higher frequencies than sensed by balance. So as you know, the semicircular canals are primarily wired to the eye extraocular muscles to, uh, to maintain the vestibulo-ocular reflex. And this way, when our head is moving, we can maintain an image on the fovea and, um, and function uh, with clear vision. Uh, but otoliths, which came first, those can are prime, have some connections to the extraocular muscles, but their primary connections are to our um, somatic um, muscle fibers. Uh, so when we lean forward, we, it, you know, in this case, our dorsal musculature is contracted to prevent us from falling. And um, they help us to stabilize our head. Um, by controlling muscle tone. So um, we all know that, but let's talk a little bit more in detail about migraine, which is a very common 
genetic disease. And there are three primary sites of symptom generation. When we think about migraine, and certainly what I was taught was that this is a problem of the blood vessels in the central nervous system. That's what I was taught in medical school. And that even if you're not taught that, it is the most sticky idea because we always think about that as a constriction and dilation of these vessels. But we know now that a lot of symptoms come from the cortex of the brain and still other symptoms come from other deep brain centers. When um, what we really think is going on in migraine is that all of the blood vessels in the head are innervated by the trigeminal nerve and uh, specifically uh, unmyelinated C fibers, which are loaded with inflammatory neuropeptides like substance P, VIP, neuropeptide Y, but most notably CGRP, calcitonin, calcitonin gene re related peptide, which is a potent vasodilator. Um, uh, these um, are the agents li which like a venom sensitize these blood vessels and cause them to hurt when they pulsate. They are, um, if you want to ask someone what meningitis feels like, ask someone who has migraine. They have chemical meningitis. As otolaryngologists, we are aware that uh, these same fibers innervate the nasal and sinus mucosa, causing congestion and pressure. And our specialty was rocked about 20 years ago by the sinus headache and migraine study, which showed that only three out of 100 individuals with sinus headache actually has rhinosinusitis. The rest have headaches in V2 in the region of the maxilla and the sinuses. And there's more interest now in the innervation of the inner ear and whether or not these kinds of changes can um, be, really affect the inner ear. And we're gonna look a little bit more into that today. So, when we think about vascular changes um, with a cerebral blood flow studies uh, uh, really do document big vascular changes in migraine with a period of oligemia, which was always thought to correspond to the aura symptoms of migraine and the hyperemia, which was thought to correspond to the headache phase of migraine, but actually the timing doesn't work out. The headache begins hours before vasodilation occurs and the headache ends hours um, before the vasodilation ends. So the vasodilation and constriction is really not the primary event in migraine. It is this, this release of inflammatory mediators, the chemical spill, if you will. And uh, that's the reason that patients with migraine who treat it early do better. And if they, if it's late, it's hard to treat a chemical spill late. You know, I tell patients that trying to treat a migraine hours after it started is like throwing a roll of paper towels off the Exxon Valdez after it has already spilled everything. So uh, where does the pain go? Well, we feel it intracranially, but it radiates because of referred innervation patterns externally. And if in live surgery experiments, if you stimulate the intracranial vessels, the rest of the brain is non-sensate, uh, you get radiation to the periphery in these characteristic patterns uh, in the upper right, the orbitotemporal parietal area that is where the hand goes during a migraine episode. And in the lower left, this is where a lot of our patients, as patients with Meniere's disease say, yeah, I feel pressure. And they put their hand right down behind their ear and in the back of their neck. Well, we also get auras and uh, there's a lot of activity going on, not just in the vessels, but in the cortex. And Carl Lashley was a physiatrist in Boston in the 1940s. And he famously drew his own scintillating scotoma as it expanded and hypothesized that there must be an electrical wave of disturbance traveling between three and five millimeters per minute across the visual cortex. 
And um, that was a very cogent observation. He, uh, across town, Aristides Leal is a, was a graduate student in the laboratory of Hollowell Davis, who is the, considered the godfather of auditory physiology. He, uh, demonst he was working on a seizure model and demonstrated this progression of excitation followed by inhibition. He showed this to his mentor who told him it was an artifact and that he should forget about it, but he published it anyway. And years, decades later, uh, it um, was his uh, spreading depression was recognized as the phenomena which explains cortical aura phenomena. So, and in the in the re in the era of functional imaging, we can very clearly demonstrate this wave of excitation followed by inhibition, uh, starting in the visual cortex. Now. In addition to uh, this, we have um, parasympathetic outflow. The superior salivatory nucleus is almost always activated in a migraine episode. And I, this wouldn't really uh, bear mentioning, except as otolaryngologists, it is really important because we get lacrimation, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, generalized soft tissue swelling, as well as wide ranging systemic effects uh, because of the body-wide parasympathetic connections. And you can even tell differ the, a difference in heart rate and blood pressure and uh, fundamental function of the vascular system and GI system in migraineurs during attacks and when they're not in attacks and even when they're in between attacks. Now, let's talk about uh, vestibular symptoms. Now, when we talked, this is a, a functional MRI of a patient having a visual aura from an exercise-induced migraine. This guy got off the basketball court and into the scanner, and this is 18 minutes of, of, of visual cortex activity. And we always think about auras as visual, but they can happen in any area of the cortex. Uh, so some people, unfortunately, they, there's a characteristic hereditary migraine pattern of, of hemiplegic migraine, where there is a, or an aura down the motor strip. So these patients get a hemiplegia as the precursor to their headache. Um, but you get aphasia, and certainly uh, dizziness is a possibility. The question is, uh, what kind of dizziness and where is the vestibular cortex? That's been elusive for a long time. The vestibular projections uh, through the uh, cortex are so diverse that it's con that it is con referred to as something as the vestibular cortical network. And you can see how broad the connections are when saccadic eye movements are evoked. But on the left, you can, uh, with um, canal stimulation, uh, although there is diffuse uh, stimulation, there is one particular area uh, called the parietal opercular area OP2 that is now generally considered the, the primary vestibular cortex. This is the area that despite the diffuse activation always seems to light up with canal stimulation. So if you get aura, spreading depression, uh, spreading across the cortex. In this area, you can have spinning vertigo. If you have uh, aura spreading over other areas of the cortex, you can have other vestibular distortions that can be um, very uh, difficult to describe for a patient to describe. Now, in addition, we have problems in the brainstem nuclei. In the era of functional imaging, we can predict with 100% accuracy the side of a migraine episode because of increased activity in the dorsolateral pons, which is the site of the trigeminal nucleus. But that is not the only brainstem nucleus that is involved in a migraine episode. Almost every patient has a characteristic, uh, their own characteristic pattern of brainstem activation. And if the 
vestibular nuclei are involved, then all vestibular input from even a normally functioning labyrinth will be distorted. And that can cause a mismatch between the two ears uh, causing disequilibrium, head motion intolerance, visual motion intolerance, and frank vertigo. Now, these patients will often tell you when they've had chronic symptoms that they have taken typical peripheral vestibular suppressants like meclizine and, and, and diphenhydramine. They have, these are uh, this is a tell that they do not have symptoms actually coming from the periphery. These are anticholinergic agents that act in the labyrinth, which, are, which have cholinergic afferents, in particular the semicircular canals, and less so uh, the otolith organs. Now, as I mentioned, the otoliths came first. And not only could we balance with an otolith organ, but you could hear with an otolith organ. Uh, so early animals could uh, um, hear uh, up to 1500 hertz uh, using the otolith organ and even mammalian um, uh, type one hair cells that are near the striola still phase lock up to 1500 hertz. But um, the primary issue is that there was a problem with the otolith organs and that there was no ability to distinguish tilt from translation. In order to distinguish tilt from translation, we needed the input of the semicircular canals. And then the, the semicircular canal and otolith input get combined um, and uh, processed in the vestibular nuclei and in a feedback loop between the vestibular nuclei and the cerebellar vermis. This feedback loop is a GABAergic loop. Uh, this shows, this illustration shows the nodulus of the vermis where this happens, where, where, where this feedback happens. And um, when we look at the uh, patients with vestibular migraine, uh, we know that they actually have the same perceptual thresholds for tilt and for rotation. So their otolith organs are not any more sensitive than oh, yours or mine and their semicircular canals are not any more sensitive. But when we put, give a stimulus that requires a low frequency combination of these two inputs called dynamic roll tilt, this is really difficult work to do, then the vestibular uh, migraine patients have an extraordinary sensitivity. Now we call it a sensitivity. What we're really showing is that they can tell that if something is wrong and because they can tell something is wrong, they know they're moving at these low frequencies. And this something that is wrong is a faulty combination of the canal and otolith inputs. And it is, this is the, uh, and some dysfunction in this feedback loop is really the best explanation for the motion intolerance and the rocking dizziness, which our patients sometimes tell us about. Remember that rocking is not a symptom that can happen in the labyrinth. There's a very, very rare lesion, a pulsatile uh, compression of a broad dehiscence or something that could cause an oscillopsia but most rocking dizziness is central and probably originates in this feedback. And it explains why those symptoms respond uniquely to clonazepam and lorazepam, which are GABAergic rather than um, uh, cholinergic. Now, symptom, uh, there are fibers which ascend to the thalamus where we become aware of motion and of our position in space. And we know that there are converging projections uh, from the vestibular nuclei and the dura sensitive neurons, uh, you know, trigeminal fibers that go to the thalamus. And it's quite possible that there is some um, convergence amplification that occurs in the thalamus uh, that cause us, us to have symptoms that may generate there. Now, this may be very, very similar to the photophobia mechanism described by Remy Bernstein, uh, 
in which there is a convergence of retinal, light sensitive retinal afferents and dura sensitive fibers in the thalamus so that when we uh, apply bright light, there's increased uh, firing of the pain fibers. And this explains why light hurts in migraine patients and motion can cause pain uh, in head motion can cause pain in some migraine patients. The, when we have uh, problems, distortions of input to the thalamus, we can get distortions in our perception of self in space, things like Alice in Wonderland syndrome, uh, shown here in the Arthur Rackham uh, famous illustrations of that story. And uh, the patients sometimes tell us that they're displaced in space. They say, like, like I feel like I'm here talking to you. I, I'm here talking to you, but I feel like I'm back here speaking, uh, looking at the world from a third position. It may be that some of the patients who we are, uh, to which we are attributing the diagnosis PPPD may actually have some dysfunction in the thalamus. And my own opinion is that uh, PPPD is largely overdiagnosed. It exists and uh, it's kind of a feature of symptoms um, that results from focusing on the vestibular sensorium, but it is very similar to the very symptoms that could be generated in the thalamus. <laughs> Obviously, the big question always has been, is it central or peripheral when we talk to a vestibular patient? And the reality seems to be that it may be both. Let's consider that patients with migraine, when we stimulate the supraorbital nerve electrically, we can induce nystag ipsilateral nystagmus in them. Now, when we do this, um, we know it is, it's ipsilateral. It has a mean latency of about 25 seconds and lasts for about 120 seconds. This corresponds roughly to what we would expect from a neuropeptide release and then sequestration. It is visually suppressed and the linear and the slow phase of the nystagmus is linear rather than logarithmic, proving its peripheral origin. How about the inner ear? Is it innervated by these vessels? Well, it seems to be. And so how do we um, uh, manipulate that system? Well, these C fibers, which are present all over the body, are, um, also are, have on them a family of receptors called vanilloid receptors. These are receptors that are sensitive to thermal change and mechanical distortion and to acid and um, also to capsaicin. It is when we eat hot peppers, uh, it is the stimulation of the vanilloid receptors in our tongue that causes the release of these very peptides and that causes a, our mouth to burn. So uh, when we give um, capsaicin, we have big changes in cochlear blood flow seen in the upper left. We also, see a threshold elevation of about 10 decibels across all frequencies. This is not a low frequency threshold elevation. This is across all frequencies and it's reversible. Um, this uh, threshold elevation is not caused by any change in endocochlear potential, uh, but it seems to be related to a blunting of the tuning curve, but in a, in a way that is not typical. Usually when the tuning curve is blunted, the, um, the uh, specificity of that uh, uh, inner hair cell aiming or the, that mechanical focus gets broadened, but this retains its rather sharp peak, just uh, less extreme. Now Zoltan Vass at Oregon Health Sciences University um, it was in Nuttall's lab, and he showed that there you could stimulate V1 and cause rather profound changes with transmural extravasation of proteins in the cochlear medial artery. Now, he didn't look at the vestibular labyrinth, but it has the same innervation. 
And you can see how different the stimulated versus, versus the control um, uh, animals were. So it, make, it begs the question, could this mechanism of inflammatory mediator uh, release, release a cascade of physiologic changes that causes blood vessel changes and diffusion of inflammatory mediators which have their own effects on the hearing and on the vestibular epithelium? And could it cause endolymphatic high drops in some in, in individuals? And or maybe it just goes back to normal. Maybe there are episodes the ear goes through and goes back to normal, and in other individuals, the ear gets injured. Um, Robert Bailo, uh, he looked at uh, patients who had a family history of, of Meniere's disease and migraine together, and he looked at these individuals and saw that. In the patients who had both Meniere's disease and migraine, there was an earlier onset of the symptoms. Those are the black bars, and this is, this is age. Um, and, um, they, and that once hearing loss occurs, uh, there wasn't very much progression. That is to say, um, uh, once the, the presence of migraine did not seem to affect the progression of hearing loss after the hearing loss actually occurred. Uh, when, uh, when you look at the Meniere's patients compared to the um, patients who have Meniere's disease and migraine, there is a much higher female to male prevalence in the Meniere's disease migraine group, uh, very uh, much higher uh, family history of vertigo and uh, a much higher incidence of a bilateral hearing loss in those individuals. It makes us think that Meniere's disease may be a complication of migraine in some individuals. Um, we know that hydropic ears have impaired cochlear blood flow, but what, it, what fits into this model is that hydropic ears have about 70% fewer C fibers. And we think that this uh, is important when we uh, even experimental high drops can induce these changes. You know, Meniere's disease burns out because even though the ear might get continue to get battered by migraine storms, it has a much uh, um, a, a much more uh, sparse population of C fibers to affect injury on the ear, in much the same way that you get adapted to. Uh, spicy food and it takes more and more capsaicin to get you that satisfying uh, glow of heat. When we look at the epidemiology, we know the prevalence of, of migraine I, in International Headache Society criteria migraine is 13%. And believe me, IHS migraine is so obvious that you don't need a doctor to to diagnose it. You can go to the mall and ask the teenagers in, who are running the piercing pagoda, you know, if they have, if you have migraine and they'll know because this is such an obvious sort of criteria. But a lot of patients with migraine don't meet the criteria. More than a quarter of patients with migraine will get dizziness in their lifetime, vertigo. And so it's very high incidence of vestibular migraine. We know that up to 56% of patients with, um, of, uh, with Meniere's disease have this obvious migraine and that there's a lifetime prevalence uh, of, uh, med of migraine uh, in Meniere's disease of 43% in women and 19% in men. Really, when we're in the clinic, we should be seeing 15 or 20 vestibular migraine patients for every single Meniere's patient we see. Uh, it also bears mentioning that Meniere's attacks are accompanied by at least one classical migraine symptom like headache or photophobia or aura symptoms and about 45% of patients uh, all, all the time and uh, only sometimes in about 11% of patients. So there are some rather notable characteristics and similarities between Meniere's disease and migraine, mostly that both 
are the types of episodes which can be triggered. We tell our Meniere's patients to avoid salt. And well, in migraine, dehydration is one of the primary triggers. So eating salt just causes dehydration. And uh, food triggers, you know, caffeine, chocolate, and alcohol, and Meniere's disease can be helpful. But those are the, the three caffeine, chocolate, and red wine in particular are the three horsemen of the migraine apocalypse of all of the food triggers which have been described. Uh, they are food triggers, not because they're, you're allergic to them, but because they have, uh, they resemble central um, uh, stimulatory neurotransmitters or they're complex chemical byproducts of fermentation or dehydration. Um, Meniere's disease and migraine are famously aggravated by stress and uh, respond to stress management. They are both famously aggravated by allergy and both respond to allergy management. And there's a direct uh, correlation. Uh, Jennifer can tell you all about allergy and Meniere's disease. Uh, there is also Meniere's disease is an excitatory followed by an inhibitory nystagmus. That's the excitatory phase is rarely witnessed, but it begs the question if, if uh, spreading depression might be possible in the vestibular epithelium. We also know that um, Meniere's disease burns out and migraine tends to burn out as well. The headaches that people experience uh, in youth tend to become less uh, debilitating and intense and simmer down to a generalized pressure. In fact, a lot of our patients tell us that they no longer have headache when we have a vestibular migraine patient. And then on further questioning, you find out that they have pressure that's there almost all the time. They just don't consider it a headache compared to what they used to suffer. So um, that, along with the epidemiology, which we mentioned, and the lifetime prevalence of Meniere's disease is very um, uh, notable. 85% uh, of patients with bilateral Meniere's disease have IHS migraine. So it's, it, no, it, it's taken us a long time to come back around to something that uh, Prosper Meniere himself pointed out 150 years ago. If it is not incontestable that individuals who are prey to vertigo, syn syncope and vomiting have at the same time head noises and rapidly become deaf, is it not less certain that cerebral states called migraine give place in the end to similar attacks and that the deafness which arises in these circumstances would seem to us inevitably to be related to a disease of the same nature? So it's not surprising that some of the patients we see will meet the criteria for vestibular migraine and others will meet the criteria very specifically for Meniere's disease, but a lot of people are gonna fall in between the two. Um, when we do VNG testing, uh, we may uh, see that there is a caloric weakness in 15 to 35% of patients with vestibular migraine. Well. Uh, these patients have migraine headache and there's something that is actually injuring the labyrinth. Uh, we see abnormal saccades and we usually expect to see in patients 65 and older, but in a 35 year old young woman who comes to the clinic. And uh, so very often you don't get four caloric irrigations because the patient got so, was so sensitive to the stimulation they would not allow uh, further calorics. And also, instead of recovering and driving themselves home, the patient uh, uh, had a long incapacitating attack provoked by the stimulation of the VNG, which caused them to um, be, uh, which was a memorable event and swears, off ever, swears them off of ever having vestibular testing again. Believe it or not, there's even a coincidence of migraine and BPPV. If you can get a vestibular nerve weakness from migraine, well, maybe you can get uh, injury of the end organ, uh, uh, the utricle, and get more BPPV. Well, it turns out that migraine is three times more frequent in idiopathic BPPV 
than in BPPV that's secondary to head trauma or surgery. Um, the migraine is two times more prevalent in patients with BPPV than in age and sex, sex match controls. And uh, in general, if you have migraine, you're seven and a half times more likely to get BPPV. Uh, when you uh, look at BPPV, uh, there's a definite female to male prevalence. And about 33% of, uh, of, of episodes are preceded by headache immediately uh, before uh, the BPPV um, occurs. When you look at cases of recurrent BPPV, uh, there is a huge uh, three 0.2 to 1 prevalence of a female to male uh, patients, especially in the menopausal years. So we think that hormonal fluctuations really may increase the tendency to develop BPPV, uh, probably because of an aggravation of migraine activity. This is a patient uh, who's from my YouTube channel. I have many patients. Uh, you know, you know, 15 or 20 with recurrent BPPV, they didn't have significant other ear symptoms or even headache. She had ear fullness in one ear. <clears throat> and uh, we, she had been fixed with canaleth repositioning seven times in the preceding four years um, by a competent uh, physical therapist. And, um, she was treated with preventive therapy, nortriptyline, low dose uh, uh, nortriptyline at 20 milligrams and her ear fullness went away and her recurrent BPPV stopped. I looked at um, 500 patients in my clinic and uh, I think uh, with uh, 236 vestibular migraine patients, 212 BPPV patients, and 169 migraine patients. And you can see there's a distinct overlap of these problems. And uh, of the vestibular migraine patients, 22% uh, percent of them have BPPV. And of, of generalized BPPV patients, um, uh, about almost 30% of them had migraine. These are really high compared to the population prevalence of BPPV and migraine in the general population. So there are other otologic uh, presentations of migraine as well. And I'm only mentioning facial pressure because of the migraine and otolaryngology study that rocked the, the world, the vestibular, the, the rhinologic society uh, doesn't want to talk about it. If you submit a paper with the word migraine, it will not be uh, accepted. Uh, but in otology, we have lots of patients with aural pressure, and that can be a manifestation of migraine activity in the ear. Uh, we have patients with hyperacusis because of possible uh, distortions and hyperactivity in the vestibular nuclei. Uh, patients who have recurrent vestibulopathy of unknown origin may not have, may not all have reactivation of herpes simplex virus. Um, from chickenpox, uh, they actually may have uh, recurrent migraine apathy of the vestibular nerve that can cause enhancement on MRI. Uh, and that responds. In fact, uh, Antony Mikulik uh, did a nice study showing that 77% uh, of patients with recurrent vestibulopathy of unknown origin uh, responded to a three part. Uh, a treatment regimen of either topiramate uh, or nortriptyline, depending on which one they tolerated, and uh, caffeine cessation alone. And of course, recurrent idiopathic BPPV, uh, otalgia, and maybe even sudden sensory neural hearing loss. And there's been some evidence recently that if you take patients and you randomize them and you treat patients with dexamethasone perfusions, but then one half of the patients get uh, empiric migraine management with preventive agents, uh, that six months later, there is a 10 decibel a better outcome in the patient who got the empiric migraine 
treatment. So in summary, um, symptoms of dizziness can be created by migraine mechanisms in the cerebral cortex, in the brainstem nuclei, uh, in the interaction between the vestibular nuclei and the cerebellar vermis, in the thalamus, and also in the inner ear. So, um, and so these mechanisms can create a really challenging combinations of central and peripheral vestibular symptoms. And uh, in some susceptible individuals, it seems that Meniere's disease may develop as a complication of migraine. Uh, and if both are present, we should treat both. That's often beneficial and necessary. I see as much Meniere's disease as anyone. And I treat a lot of migraine and I only uh, get to where I do a genomycin uh, uh, perfusion uh, uh, two or three times a year. Uh, most, I think that the migraine management is uh, effective at calming down uh, Meniere's activity and preserving function. Um, so uh, familiarity with migraine and its treatment is now uh, emerging as a necessary part of otologic medicine. Our uh, neurology colleagues are in a period of transition and they don't know how to treat these peripheral problems, even if they are aggravated by migraine mechanisms. And they are often, far too often married to the ICHD, the International uh, classification of headache disorders, classifications of migraine and vestibular migraine, and they inappropriately use the existing criteria as exclusion criteria for treatment. So the patients come back and they say, he doesn't, he doesn't think I have migraine. Uh, he doesn't think I have vestibular migraine. He doesn't even think I have uh, migraine. And, you know, uh, we just have to remind ourselves that those criteria exist for study so that epidemiologic and so that drug efficacy studies can be competently performed and we can advance our science and knowledge and create new distinctions. And so any classification is a work in progress and we should not be guilty of using them as exclusion criteria ourselves. So I thank you very much. And uh, I have left time so that there would be um, uh, room for discussion here. You know, Mike, well, was... uh, this is Daryl, that, you know, <clears throat> uh, we, you know, Bob Balo, of course, is across town from us. And sure. And uh, yeah. prior to Chad Cho coming on board, uh, I would frequently uh, send patients to Bob for, you know, dizziness cause undetermined. That was the uh, very common diagnosis in our, in our clinic. Uh, was a, you know, you had to put something down as a diagnosis and cause undetermined uh, was a very frequent uh, diagnosis mm -hmm. code. And yeah. uh, we joke though, because you'd send them to Bob and invariably the diagnosed kids came back migraine. And by golly, maybe he was right. <laughs> so that's very important with your talk. That's really enlightening. One, one question, Michael, Do, the drugs, you know, I, I don't treat migraine. I know nothing about migraine treatment. Uh, all I know is what I see on the television with, uh, uh, you know, Serena Williams and and uh, Kara, uh, what's her what's her name? Uh, uh, yeah. I'll, you know, the, anyway, the stars that uh, I, I think uh, even uh, Whoopi Goldberg is on. But anyway, uh, can you treat? Classical Meniere's, uh, yeah, classical Meniere's disease with uh, migraine drugs that are advertised, will it help the um, Meniere's disease? It will help them a lot if they have, especially if they have migraine headache. Yeah, because the, the what you can imagine is that the uh, the ear, the, if a patient is unlucky and their mi pattern of migraine, as we mentioned, some people have V2 migraine, some people have occipital migraine, they get it in their neck. Uh, but if you're unlucky and this happens to involve your ear and the inner ear, 
then the inner ear can suffer migraine episodes, migraine episodes with transient, modest threshold elevations, and uh, maybe some dizziness, but at some point the ear becomes injured. And when the ear becomes injured and, ha and, and turns into Meniere's disease, it becomes a, like Stephen Rauch says, a jalopy. It takes on a life, of, an unreliable life of its own. Well, you can really prevent further injury by controlling the migraine activity. And these new drugs, uh, the, the classic treatments for migraine were that uh, are calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, sodium channel blockers, which are seizure medicines, um, and um, uh, tricyclic antidepressants or serotonin uh, drugs. The, uh, and those are very, very successful, but it's just a trial and error. You have to go through and find a medication that is both effective and that is tolerable. It doesn't create new side effects that are problematic. Uh, the new, the first new drugs to come out in, in uh, 25 years, um, almost 30 years since Imitrex uh, or Sumatriptan uh, are these new medicines you're seeing advertised. And those are uh, targeting CGRP, this molecule that um, uh, activates, uh, that it is so uh, irritating in the central nervous system. And that some of them block the receptor and some of them block the act of the CGRP ligand itself. They're injectable um, uh, biologics, uh, antibodies that, that you can use uh, monthly or they're oral agents. And the beauty of them is that you can use them as they're very effective in aborting a migraine episode. Uh, but they can also be used as prevention. And most of the time, uh, most all of these abortive drugs, if used uh, daily, can lead to rebound and worsening of the problem. Well, that's not true of this new class of medications. So it's really uh, a breakthrough. Um, I, 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 every with Meniere's disease, uh, you know, if they have migraine, if they say no, no history of migraine, is that sufficient to sort of put that in the back burner and, and not consider uh, treatment uh, for for migraine and just treat them in years? And the second question is, uh, we have found beta histine to be uh, to change our practice in terms of controlling the vertigo of Meniere's disease. Do you have an explanation for why that works or if you believe it does work? And could that somehow be related to uh, to migraine? Um, the answer to the first part is that uh, I don't take a, no, I don't have a history of migraine um, a report from a patient uh, very uh, seriously because they don't know what migraine is and, and what it isn't. And uh, they'll, they'll tell you that, oh, I have a lot of sinus. You know, I've, I've, I've always, I always have sinus pressure and uh, they've been managing that with Sudafed or something like that, but that's migraine. Uh, in fact, you know, even tension headache, people say, well, how do you know it's not tension headache? Well, uh, the, uh, I, I gave a talk similar to this to uh, a bunch of neurologists in Boston last weekend, and they're all discussing these classifications and saying, when are we gonna get rid of tension headache? We all know tension headache is just migraine that is mild. Uh, and so treating uh, for migraine empirically really is uh, worthwhile, especially if you're considering something destructive. And uh, number two, I'm not sure how beta histine um, uh, may work. And uh, yeah, I know that there, there's been some controversy about the large uh, multi, uh, uh, multi-center study uh, published in Europe a few years ago, which showed that it was not efficacious, uh, but it certainly seems to be benign. And I, um, you know, Meniere's disease is one of those things where, you know, 70% of, you know, almost anything gives 70% uh, you know, improvement because of some, you know, the variability of the disease. So, so it's been a slippery thing to study.
But I think the migraine connection is a little too strong to ignore. Michael, thank you. And John, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but thanks, Michael. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Daryl. Dr. Tishido, this is Maria McCullough. Um, thank you for that talk. That was excellent. I am a nurse practitioner and I work at University of Colorado. I worked with Dr. Carol Foster. I work with Stephen Cass now. Oh, good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, um, I have taken on a lot of the dizzy patients over the past few years and I've done the same thing as you. The past three years, I have treated all of my Meniere's patients with migraine prophylaxis, um, whether or not they have a history of migraine. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually collected the data and presented it at um, Super Saturday in Philly recently. And oh, um, yeah, it was very interesting to see um, the improvement in the Meniere symptoms in the patients who did not have a history of classic migraine, um, who did not meet that criteria. And so um, I, I would really love for that to get published. Um, I also would love to do, you know, a a controlled trial or, you know, compare classic or um, standard Meniere's treatment with migraine prophylaxis. Um, mm -hmm. But as you know, it can be very difficult to do that with all the, um, you know, the, the variability in the medications and, um, and just the time that it takes. And so just wondering if um, what you're talking about, about how to, um, how to get this published so it's out there more and so that it's, you know, um, well, I'd love to see. I'd love to see what you have done so far, and I think that there is uh, plenty of room to do uh, uh, carefully constructed studies to answer these questions about the response rate of of, uh, of Meniere's disease, specifically to migraine treatment. Uh, it takes a lot of work, and time, and energy to collect these patients, to follow them in a competent way, and mm -hmm. but uh, we uh, would like you to. Uh, come and uh, uh, show them at our migraine and otolaryngology study group meetings, which are at the academy. And, um, and I can correspond with you about uh, by email to um, help you uh, craft something that might organize your results in a uh, format where the results will really be as highly valid as possible. Yes, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, okay. I'd be happy to send those results over, sure. That's great. Thank you. As far as prophylactic, uh, I, I sometimes use just use a small dose of nortriptyline, like you already mentioned. And yeah. To me, it's kind of like a, a good drug to just kind of start, and and I guess if that doesn't work, then find to find a neurologist who can go further with other drugs. But I find it uh, uh, very easy to put them on 10, 20, maybe twenty five milligrams just at night. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent first choice. Uh, it, you know, the <laughs> nortriptyline was a terrible drug. It was obviously a tricyclic. It was manufactured from an antihistamine. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, it, there weren't very many drugs for treatment of depression. And uh, to get, but, and, and these were not very good because these tricyclics, because to get the antidepressant effect, you had to use high doses, uh, 100, 150, even up to 300 milligrams. And at those doses, they had horrible side effects. In fact, your patients will sometimes come back to you. You know, they said, I never took the medicine. I read the side effects and I thought you were a nice man. And obviously you're trying to kill me. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah. and the reality is that the reason it works so well is that in addition to the serotonin effect, uh, there are lots of other ways that it works. It, it's a med uh, these tricyclics are medium potency, calcium channel blockers and medium potency sodium channel blockers. Uh, so that already is kind of like the topiramate and kind of like the verapamil or diltiazem. They are anticholinergic. So they, uh, they offset some of the orthostasis and the uh, cholinergic effects that are a part of migraine for a lot of these patients. And they help people to sleep. Uh, so a lot of these patients, they have stress, they don't sleep and uh, they get better sleep and they just get holistically better. So I, I agree. Some of these patients, they come back, it's, it's their spouse who brings them back and they said, oh my God, you found the missing vitamin. You know, I got my husband back. 
Well, that, but that's, a great, used, uh, that's a great way to start. And low doses, yeah, yeah. you know, 20 milligrams, you'd be surprised at how well people tolerate it and how, uh, how well they respond. Yeah, from the middle 70s or late 70s, when I discovered biofeedback was effective for tinnitus, I also found that uh, uh, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, the, these medications work quite well. Uh, even for yeah. tinnitus, if the patient's uh, waking up in the middle of the night and they start complaining about their tinnitus, uh, it works very well. So it's kind of like it can be a magic, like you said, a magic vitamin. Yeah, well, uh, tinnitus is something I didn't mention in my summary, uh, but there is a distinct uh, correlation between the laterality and intensity of tinnitus with migraine. And so I ask my patients, does your tinnitus change? Is it, does it, uh, is it always the same level uh, or does it actually change its character and its intensity from day to day? And if it's changing its intensity or character, then those changes, uh, especially in a patient who doesn't have obvious high drops, those changes are not happening in the inner ear, they're happening in the brain. Uh, just as a patient with migraine may have be more light sensitive uh, on some days than others, uh, even on a day when they're not having a headache. And those patients who have variability of their tinnitus are uniquely responsive to these medications and nortriptyline in particular.